G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy. Today I am going to do a redraft. This has uh, actually been a requested video a number of times this off season, but I've decided to prioritize some other projects and in particular doing a draft series where I'm doing individual videos on every draft prospect. So today I am going to give in to the pressure and do the 2023 redraft, where I'm essentially gonna have the draft play out a top 20 of last year's prospects as though it was happening today. I'm not gonna lie to you, there have been three times where I've started preparing for this video and then sort of gave up because I didn't like it. Because the fact of the matter is, I don't know how much would really change. Maybe that is an unsexy opinion. So I'll give you my top 20 having said all that. But I do remember doing the 2022 redraft at the end of 2023. And that one felt okay to make because the nature of that draft was interesting. There were a lot of evenly rated mids and you could at least say that with a year of AFL experience we'd be able to see which ones have sort of risen to the top, which ones have sort of started to shade the other similarly ranked players. Whereas in this year's draft, I just feel like a lot of that, particularly that top 10, isn't going to change too much, regardless of how well players from outside the top 10 performed last year. Like Darcy Wilson was fantastic. Lawson Humphreys, you know, Harvey Thomas from GWS. Like how much have these guys really done to overlap some of the players taken early in the draft. Nonetheless, we will get into specifics, so you'll see what I mean. I just found it comparatively a lot harder than 2022, which by the way, I'm gonna do a new version of 2022. Um, I'm gonna film it right after this, so members, you'll have that early, and the rest of you will get it, um, yeah, in about a day after this one comes out. So today we're doing 2023, and like I said, it is a tough one to do. So we're gonna start from the top and move down to the end of the top 20. I do have some new names in here, and I've shaken it up. But to be honest, I look, let's just start with, the top nine or 10 selections. I'll get the top 10 selections up for you. I don't think I can change much of this, to be honest. I mean, I don't think there's any argument Harley Reid's going to pick one. And uh, would anyone have displaced any of the top five? Would you even reorder it? See, this is get where it gets tough because there's a lot of key position players in here who you have to accept will take time. So to the fact that Jed Walter hasn't necessarily lit it up at AFL level like Nick Watson has, I still think if this draft was redone today, you still give a little bit of extra value to those top end key position players. And a well-performed small forward in Nick Watson, who was fantastic, you gotta bear a few things in mind, namely for a start, that Nick Watson played in by far a better team than any of the prospects taken before him. So well, there was a little bit of conjecture this year about uh, North Melbourne not taking Nick Watson and, and instead going for Zane Dersma. I'm still gonna absolutely say that at, at this current point in time, I'm not gonna move that order around because Zane Dersma is a much more of a project type, you'd have to say, and, and, and certainly played in a weaker team than Nick Watson. Now, I don't wanna take anything away from Nick Watson. I think as far as Hawthorne's expectations have gone for his first season, that's about as good as you could hope. He was a very impactful small forward. Once he started getting his kicking boots on and kicking accurately um, in a good team, he was an absolute key part of that forward line mix. But, you know, Zane Dersma is a six foot three, six foot four midfielder forward. I mean, he took one of the marks of the year this year just because he didn't demonstrate as much in his first season. I think that was always to be expected. So as far as I'm concerned, you still sort of have a bias toward those players based on position, on upside, on development. And I'm not willing to change that order. Colby was well-performed. Harley was well-performed. I think those ones are fairly self-explanatory. I just don't think anyone else has done anything to shift that order around. So let's talk about six to 10. This one is also tough because Riley Sanders, you know, he didn't play as much as say a Darcy Wilson, but being in the position that he's in, you know, being an inside midfielder who, you know, has a great tank and, uh, you know, he's fairly physically built, but still to become an inside midfielder and play his role at AFL level, it's going to take him some time. So I'm very unconvinced that the Bulldogs would go anything else with his selection. Don't worry, I will switch it up as we get further down. But same thing with Caleb Windsor. I thought he, you know, I'm a, I suppose you could compare Darcy Wilson and Caleb Windsor as somewhat similar. And you could say that Darcy Wilson had the better season, but I still see mountains of upside with Caleb Windsor. I think this was a bit of a bolt at the time. Windsor was probably projected more top 10, top 15, and Melbourne took him here, and I think they're very comfortable with that. And then you get into the talls, and it, it does get a little messy here because Adelaide traded in. So I was thinking, oh, in this scenario, do, do I revert back to the pre-trade order? I'm just going to keep it simple and just go with the order the, the picks were taken in. And with key position players, I mean, Daniel Curtin, I know he might be a midfielder, etc. Nate Caddy, you know, Essendon traded up to get him. If you're asking me, you know, I probably think I'd prefer to have Nate Caddy on my team than a Daniel Curtin, but it's line ball. And yeah, sort of respect the way that the draft actually played out. And there hasn't been anything meaningful 
to separate those two. And equally, I don't, just don't think any well-performed players that are non-key position did enough to leapfrog them just yet. And of course, there's Ethan Reid there, but as a 200 centimeter ruckman, um, who many consider to be a top 10 prospect, I'm just not, not willing to change that up. So you can see why so far, I was a little bit uncomfortable making this video because I was like, is there enough? However, it does get a little bit more diversified from this point. So we got the top 10 pretty much locked in stone. I don't think anything has changed in the last year. To contrast that with 2022, where after the first handful of selections, you had a lot of evenly rated midfielders and some rose to the top and some exceeded expectations. Uh, I just don't think that's the case with the 2023 draft. I want to be honest about that. So let's start moving things around. This is where Geelong actually took Connor Rose Sullivan. And to be honest, that you could easily make the argument they would again, but this is where I have them taking Darcy Wilson. Now, I do want to clarify something. It's important to establish some criteria or some ground rules when you're doing these drafts. So I'm going to assume that every team has the same needs as each other. And it's also not a just rough ranking of the players in, in terms of how well they've performed. This is a redraft, but just ignoring team needs because if you focused on team needs, then it takes too much away from what I'm trying to do here. And it's, it's a bit of a ranking, but you also take into account upside as well. So we'll just assume that every team has the same needs and therefore Geelong don't necessarily need to go a key back. It would just become, who do you subjectively rate more? A key position, Conor O'Sullivan or a Darcy Wilson, knowing what Darcy Wilson produced this year. So this is probably where I have my first change. Darcy Wilson, true up from 18, I think it was, to St Kilda on the night. I can't remember the exact pick, but a very, very well-performed player this year and didn't win the Rising Star, but was certainly in calculations for that. Then we've got GWS bidding on Hawthorne's Kulsha Deer. This is probably the biggest leap. So I think, you know, Kulsha was taken at the end of the draft and it, it seemed to be one of those classic father-sons where they sort of bid on with one of the last picks or, or Hawthorne took him themselves. I actually can't remember how that played out. Either way, he went late, wasn't highly rated, but I will give a big bias towards a key position player who exceeds expectations so greatly in his first season you could use the same logic that it's easy for a prospect to perform well in a good team like Hawthorne were this year that is true but some of these other teams were good this year as well and for an 18 or 19 year old key position forward to come in and play the way he did and be an important part of that team then uh, I'm willing to give him his flowers for that season and move him up massively so then I've got Conor O'Sullivan going to the GWS Giants the next pick so again a player who hasn't played a lot in fact hasn't played at all this year but you still got to acknowledge the talent that got him drafted in the first place and as a key position defender he probably shouldn't have played in his first season anyway being at the Geelong Cats as well a, a team right in the thick of it there was no need to give him games so this is where it gets a little bit tough you're comparing apples with oranges but nonetheless I've got Connor sliding down a couple of picks but not massively then we've got the Demons here at pick 14 and this was originally Colton Tholstrup which you know maybe this is my subjective opinion I thought that was a little bit of a reach too at the time and Colton played this year but I think this is probably where we start shoving a few other types in who performed really well this season so this one is going to go to Logan Morris a I think he's 191 centimeter sort of third tall forward for the Brisbane Lions and it helped once again that he came in and played in a good team but he was an important part of that kicked plenty of goals I, I've seen enough to suggest he probably should never have gone in the 30s I think there's a good enough talent base there where a club could take him in the first round would Melbourne actually pick Logan Morris over Colton Tholstrup. Again, we're ignoring needs, ignoring the fact that, you know, they might not want a third tall key forward. But I think on talent, this is about right for Logan Morris. Now, these things could shift over time, but I'm not willing to move them up too much because it has only been one season. I'll get a couple of Gold Coast Academy boys out the way. Will Graham and Jake Rogers, in that order. I think Will Graham was really good in his first season. He's showing really good signs that he could be a pretty high level player one day, either as a defender or as a midfielder who lays a lot of tackles. I think he was really well performed this year. And a bit of a smaller midfielder, but I'm going to assume he probably probably goes around the same range as he did in the actual draft a couple of picks later. Same thing with Jordan Croft, the Western Bulldogs father son. Now, the, the reality of where he would actually get bid on in the national draft is possibly around needs as well. But again, it's just awkward when it's a father son and, and clubs are sometimes bidding on players that they rate and sometimes they just don't bid. But let's just assume he's a top 15 key forward talent from last year's draft who I'm not willing to see slide too much although a couple of players have earned their right to bolt into that top 15 for the time being. So then we got our last three picks, and these are a little different. At 18, I'm going to go Lawson Humphreys. This was a great pick by the Geelong Cats. Again, how do we quantify how well he played this year when Geelong have a knack 
of getting players in and performing well early in certain roles. I think he's definitely talented. He was taken, oh, I reckon about pick 60 off the top of my head, and he's going to bolt into the first round of this year's draft, where a, a lot of these prospects haven't played a lot of footy around this range that is superseding, but he, he definitely did enough, in my opinion, to bolt into this top 20, and I think he was either 18 or 19 when he was drafted, so, you know, basically a drafty age. At 19, this is where I got Colton Falstrup. Again, he hasn't done anything wrong. I think he played about 10 games this year. Um, got about like 14 possessions a game. Looks like a good level AFL talent. I would have been happy if he'd ended up at West Coast some way or another. But nonetheless, I just have a few others going ahead of him. Um, it is fairly even and hard to separate at this point. And then finally, I've got the Saints picking at this pick. And I'm going to throw a juicy one in here. I'm going to go Logan Evans. He was actually, I think, a mid-season selection in 2024, which means he would have been eligible for the 2023 draft and presumably went under, well, he certainly went undrafted. <laughs> Thought he showed some really good signs, um, you know, with his meters gained this year, playing in the defense for Port Adelaide. Unexpectedly, you know, broke into that team and played well in a good functioning team. I'm going to give him his chocolates. Again, it's it's hard. There's a number of players that, you know, could be taken here who haven't played games, like Charlie Edwards, Riley Hardiman. Uh, Joel Frazier did play some footy this year. Harvey Thomas was well-performed for GWS, but being a smaller player, uh, discriminate a little bit against that on position. Will Green was taken to the top 15-ish as a ruckman to Sydney, so how do we rate him? James Leake, Will McKay didn't play a game. This is why this one is a tough draft to rate. In some ways, you know, particularly with that top 10, I went too conservative, I didn't change anything, and you could certainly say that I've tried to mix it up too much in the second 10, but uh, this is where it's over to you. Let me know in the comments, guys, what you agree with and disagree with. There's absolutely no way we're all gonna agree on this. It's uh, a little bit tough, and we all have our own biases, and we've all seen different teams more than others, but let me know if there's any absolute howls in here or anything that you think I got right. But for now, I'll thank you for watching, I'll thank you for being subscribed, and I'll see you the next one. Stay tuned for 2022, should be out in a day. Cheers.